Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. And I invite you to turn in your Bibles or electronic devices as I read John, chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, And he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me, where have you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, 
my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that, and by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Would you join me as we pray together? Heavenly Father, we confess we need you. We acknowledge you as Almighty God, the Creator of heaven and earth. You are the Lord, the God of all flesh. Nothing is too hard for you. And Lord, in these days of abundant change and uncertainty, we praise you as the one who's in control, the one who never changes. Lord, we need you now more than ever. We're grieving because we're supposed to be together in your house celebrating the greatest event the world has ever seen. And yet, in our current reality, that's not possible. Things are not the way they should be. And all of us feel a sense of loss. And we're saddened by the fact that we live in a broken world and our own hearts are sinful. We feel disappointment and we long for your forgiveness and for your peace. Would you open our eyes so we can see that through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, lasting change is possible. Lord, there are so many things we can pray about. Many of us are feeling the weight of a heavy burden. And at times we struggle with fear, with anxiety, with loneliness. Your word says when we feel afraid to cast our cares onto you because you care for us. Lord, help us to do that. We pray for our community, our nation, and the world, asking that in the midst of this pandemic, many people will turn to you and they will bow their knee and confess you as Lord. We pray for those who are sick and suffering. We ask that you would protect the doctors and nurses and healthcare workers who are at greater risk from the virus than anyone else. And Lord, we pray also for protection for the people we love. These are the times when our faith, our family, and our friends mean so much. We bring before you those in our church family who are dealing with health concerns. We think of Chris Page, Mike Merritt, Dennis Lorenzen, Blake and Jane Bottomley, Carolyn Frederick's brother, John Wright, Steve and Kathy Boardman, John Scow, John Blaha, and Matt Rosendahl. Lord, you're the great physician. We bring all of these people and others who are dealing with health concerns into your care because we know that's the best place they can be. Thank you that Stonebridge is a generous church. And because of faithful giving, we're able to partner with missionaries and mission organizations to spread the gospel around the world. And we pray for Phil and Mitzi Christensen who serve with Standing Stone Ministries. Would you give Phil wisdom to speak the right words as he comes alongside pastors and church leaders who are in need of encouragement? 
And Lord, as Pastor Brandon shares with us the glorious truth that Jesus Christ rose from the grave, may our fear give way to faith and may our disappointment give way to hope. Because Jesus lives, we will get through this pandemic or any other crisis. We pray these things in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, hello again, Stonebridge. Um, I think it goes without saying that this is not how we expected to spend our first Easter with our new church family. You all are supposed to be here right now. Uh, my daughters are supposed to be wearing their pretty new Easter dresses in the third row from the back. Um, shout out to all of the moms who have made their children put on their Easter clothes for the family picture this year. We've got that waiting for us when I get home. Um, but this is, this is so different than what we expected. Um, the, the, the traditions that uh, many of us are used to, this is the first Easter where uh, that that we won't be able to do some of those things, that we won't be able to spend with certain family members. This last week, as we kind of did that little poll on Facebook, uh, many of you indicated that uh, the normal rhythms of life have been crowded out by things like loneliness or frustration or or boredom and, and grief. And so it's just, it's been a hard week. And this is not the way that we expected Easter to go. Some of us are grieving the loss of loved ones right now because of this crisis. And so in a word, Easter this year feels really disappointing. Feels really disappointing. And yet, the frustration and disappointment and confusion that many of us are, are feeling as we hunker down in, a, in our homes this morning is not that far from the first, how the first Easter morning began. That very first Easter morning was not uh, filled with fanfare or bright colors or uh, beautiful dresses. The, the hallelujah chorus was not playing as the women arrived at the grave that morning. Rather, that first Easter morning began with darkness and gloom, with sadness and confusion. The disciples' hope for a new and better world was all but lost. Their king, their savior, had been crucified. He'd been condemned as a criminal and nailed to a Roman cross, the one they thought was was about to be crowned king of the Jews and, and lord of all of the earth, instead received a crown of thorns and was executed as a common criminal. And so their expectations about how God was going to bring life, new life and joy and make this world uh, better, to renew this broken world, to redeem his people, all of their expectations for how God was going to do that we're now buried in the grave, quite literally. As the Apostle John tells the story of that first Easter day, we see three different reactions to the disappointment of Jesus' apparent defeat. Grief, fear, and skepticism. Reactions I think many of us can identify with in our present situation. But we also see what happens to those reactions when they encounter the risen Christ and find that hope is not lost as we had expected. It just came in a new way that we didn't see coming. So Mary Magdalene, the first is grief. Mary Magdalene, who was the first one to the tomb, she responded to Jesus' death with grief. When she went to the tomb that morning, she wasn't there to see if Jesus had risen yet. It's not like, you know, uh, children who wake up really early on the day that the grandparents are going to be visiting because they, they can't wait to see if they're there yet. She went to the tomb that morning to mourn and to grieve, to grieve Jesus' tragic death. And so discovering that the tomb was open and the body was missing, that was not a sign of hope. 
That was insult. That was scandal. Her beloved king, not only has he now been tragically killed, someone has run off with his body for who knows what purpose. That's what she laments as she arrives. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And even after Peter and John uh, arrive and investigate and then go back home, Mary stays at the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, verse 12, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Mary can no longer cling to hope for a new world. Her hopes died with Jesus. And and so she tries instead to cling to the memorial of that hope, to uh, cling to the emblem of all that she had thought was going to to change and and make things better and now will never be, the body of Jesus. And and it's not that far from how uh, we can be tempted to respond when we are crushed with life's disappointments, to cling to some uh, memorial of our loss, some token or reminder of what we had hoped was going to make all of the difference and now will never be. Mary tries to cling to the body of Jesus but it's gone. The tomb is open. The body is not there. And so she is devastated and confused. And and it's there in her grief and devastation that the risen Lord meets her and, and changes her world in a way she could have never imagined. So if you look at verse 14, Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him in Aramaic, and said, Rabboni, which means teacher. Beyond all hope and expectation, the man that she saw crucified days earlier stood before her risen from the grave. This is unbelievable. It is unparalleled in human history. And it means that although it didn't come as she expected, hope is not lost. It's not lost because Jesus is risen and he is bringing peace and new life to this broken world. He's making all things new. And so as Mary sees him, uh, quite understandably, she now tries to cling to him as if she's afraid of losing him again. But Jesus's death was not the end of the story. It was a new beginning and he now has a mission for Mary. He he tells her to go and report to the disciples the victory of his resurrection and his coming ascension. And she does that. She goes and announces to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and then tells uh, tells them that he had said these things to her. Jesus meets her in her grief, and her grief is replaced with purpose and joy through the truth of the resurrection. The disciples' reaction uh, to the cross was somewhat different. The disciples were the 12 men who had traveled with Jesus, now 11, after Judas' betrayal. Uh, The men that Jesus had chosen to be his special witnesses. And, And no doubt they shared Mary's grief. But the reaction emphasized in this story is fear. They were afraid. Verse 19 On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked uh, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. They were afraid. And, And what did they have to be afraid of? Well, their king and leader had just been crucified. And if this story goes the way most of these kinds of stories go, they are probably next. That's what they're afraid of. And so they're hiding. 
And, and this is even after Peter and John had gone and investigated the empty tomb that morning. Mary had run and reported to them that the, the tomb was open. And so uh, Peter and John ran there to investigate. Verse 5 uh, and stooping to look in, John saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter shows up, he barges right in and, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. What in the world could that possibly mean? I mean, if, if someone had stolen the body, would they really have taken time to unwrap it first? Um, and, and from the description, it sounds more like the body somehow passed through the cloths, uh, leaving an empty pile. Only the face cloth is described as being rolled up and set aside as no longer needed. And it's not as though the resurrection was an obvious explanation to them. Ancient Jews believed in the bodily resurrection. The Old Testament promised it. But, but they believed it was something that would happen to all people at the end of time. The idea that their crucified Lord would take that future promise and break into the present with it, that was just not on their radar. As much as Jesus tried to help them understand what was coming, they didn't have a category for that. And, and so we're not told what Peter makes of it. Uh, we are told that John saw and believed. He believed the resurrection, verses 8 and 9. He didn't necessarily understand why Christ had to be raised according to the scriptures, but he believed it happened. And yet, that evening, they're still behind locked doors, afraid for their lives. And, and that's a reaction, too, that many of us find ourselves encountering when what we thought was going to make all of the difference and change Life for the better all of a sudden falls apart. And it's like, now what? Uh, what else is going to happen? What, what else is going to go wrong? We, we become gripped by fear. The disciples are gripped. They're trapped in their fear until Jesus appears. Until he appears. In the middle of verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And so here, before their very eyes, stood their resurrected Lord. And there was no mistaking him. He was real flesh. In Luke's gospel, we're told that Jesus ate a piece of fish to prove to them that he wasn't some sort of ghost or hallucination. He was really there, real flesh. And it was the same flesh Jesus showed them the wounds in his hands and on his side, the place where he had been pierced on the cross. Yet it was transformed flesh. There was something new about it. And you see that in how he's able to pass through a locked door, uh, similar as he seemed to pass through the grave clothes. And elsewhere in Scripture, we're told that this flesh, this resurrected flesh, is immortal. It will never decay again. And when they saw him, John tells us that the disciples were glad. They were glad. Their resurrected Lord met them in their fear, and their fear gave way to joy and gladness that their king was raised, that, that he had conquered death, he will redeem his people, just not in the way they had expected. And moreover, these very men who had been fearing for their lives, they become the key witnesses to the resurrection and, and, and to the proclamation of Christ's kingdom as the rest of the New Testament story unfolds. In verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus entrusts and strengthens these men to be uh, his apostles, to have the keys of the kingdom, the message of the gospel that is able to unlock us from slavery to sin and to death. That, that sin and shame that separates us from God, it has been dealt with through Jesus 
our Savior. There is hope for a new and better life because Christ is risen from the grave. And yet, not everyone is convinced. Uh, There's one unfortunate disciple who was absent from that first meeting, uh, and there is nothing that his companions can do to convince him to ever hope again. As Thomas says in verse 25, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas responds to the cross like his fellow disciples with fear, but he responds to news of the resurrection with skepticism. Not because dead people don't rise and and so, you know, uh, this, this couldn't have happened. Everybody knew then that dead people didn't rise. We don't need modern science to tell us that that's not possible. That would take a miracle. His skepticism is not that God couldn't raise the dead, but whether or not he did. And without proof, he was unwilling to believe. And again, many of us can, can resonate with that skepticism. Uh, not just the, the skepticism over whether the resurrection is true, But even at a broader sense, the cynicism over whether or not I should ever hope for anything good again. Uh, When you have hoped so deeply and believed so strongly that something was going to change for the better and it never seems to happen, sometimes it feels easier to just stop hoping completely rather than risk being hurt and disappointed again. We need proof. We need proof if we're going to risk belief. And what's amazing here, what's amazing here is that Jesus doesn't rebuke Thomas for his unbelief. Instead, he meets him there and invites him to believe. Verse 26, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And listen to Thomas's response. One of the greatest declarations of faith in the entire New Testament. My Lord and my God. When Thomas looked into the face of the resurrected Christ, he saw the face of God. The resurrected Jesus met Thomas in his skepticism and doubt gave way to faith. He met Mary in her grief. He met the disciples in their fear. Where will he meet you? Where will he meet you? The answer is wherever you are. Wherever you are, whatever questions you're asking, whatever grief you've experienced, whatever sin you've committed, that's where Jesus meets us with the hope of the resurrection to invite us to believe. And so it is that when we encounter the risen Christ, what we find is hope. What we find is hope. Maybe not the answer that we thought we would receive, um, the way we thought God would solve our problems, but it's the answer we truly need. Christ offers us something so much better through his resurrection. He offers real and lasting peace, wholeness to whatever is broken in this world. It's interesting to notice that in each of Jesus' appearances with the disciples in this story, the first words out of his mouth are, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And, and whereas that was, of course, a common greeting in that day, even as it is in some parts of the world today, it was also a very specific promise that Jesus had given his disciples. Back in chapter 16, he said, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. 
And he's not just talking about the absence of conflict here, right? That, that moment when your kids finally stop fighting in the back of the car seat or something like that, or, or that day when we can finally go to someone's home, a friend or a family member, without fear of uh, infecting them or, or catching some disease. Like that's not, it's not just the absence of conflict. What he's describing here is the Old Testament concept of shalom, wholeness, the world as it was meant to be. He's talking about taking everything that's wrong with this broken world and finally making it all right again in Christ. One of the beautiful, uh, beautiful things about John's account of the resurrection is how he, how he frames this story with allusions to the first creation account in Genesis. He wants us to see in the cross and resurrection an echo of God's first creation so that we understand that what God is doing here is launching a new creation. He's making all things new. And so as God completed his creative work on the sixth day by making man in his image, so Jesus is crucified on the sixth day, Good Friday, paying the penalty for sinful men and declaring with his final words, it is finished. Just as God rested on the seventh day, so Jesus rests in the tomb on the seventh day, on Holy Saturday, having completed his work of redemption on the cross. Twice, John emphasizes that Jesus rose on the first day of the week, on Sunday, His resurrection marks the beginning of God's new creation, the first day of the week. John points out to us that Jesus is buried in a garden, the same setting as that first creation. And he's even mistaken for the gardener, which is this beautifully ironic allusion to this connection Jesus has with the first gardener, Adam. When Jesus equips his disciples for their mission, and breathes on them, saying, receive the Holy Spirit. It's an echo of God breathing into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. God is making all things new through his resurrected son. Everything will be made new. It's, it's like that first crocus of the spring that, that breaks the ground even when there's still snow there. So it is, God's new creation is breaking through the surface with the resurrection of Christ as that first fruits and down payment of the whole new creation to come. And and the fullness of that new creation waits for the end, right? Um, When Jesus is going to come again. And in that day, the Bible tells us that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. No more will we wake up with bodies that don't work the way they're supposed to. No more will our hearts be broken through relationships and friction. No more will our hearts be prone to sin. No more will we be disappointed with the brokenness of this world. But here is the miracle and the mystery. The peace and wholeness that God promises for that day is already present in part through the cross and resurrection of Christ. The God who raised Jesus from the dead is able to bring wholeness to our broken lives, to our broken relationships, our broken bodies, our broken marriages He's able to bring renewal even now. And that begins by healing our broken relationship with God. Whether we realize it or not, uh, quarantine, our our, our greatest problem in this world is not being quarantined or or the coronavirus. Our, Our greatest problem is not the loss of a job or a lack of friends or social interaction. It's not a lack of money or opportunities or, or health or self-confidence. Our greatest problem in this world is that we are sinners before a holy God. 
And that sin, that rebellious disobedience, severs that relationship and brings us under God's righteous judgment. The good news of Good Friday is that that sin has been decisively dealt with through the cross. We have a willing Savior who took our place in love. And the good news of Easter morning is therefore that there really is new life available in Christ. New life in Christ. Easter proves to us, for starters, that Jesus didn't die for his own sins. If he had been guilty, sin would have had a, er, death would have had a claim on him. It would have been able to hold him in the grave because death is the penalty of sin. But Jesus was innocent, and so death had no jurisdiction to keep him there. And so Christ conquered death and brings new life and forgiveness in a way we could never have expected. He makes us part of God's new creation. And, and if his cross and resurrection are, are able to deal with our greatest problem, then wouldn't we expect to find some answer to all of our other problems in the cross and resurrection as well? Hope for a better life, a better world that doesn't always come the way we expect. But that's no reason to give up hope. Easter may start with disappointment, but it ends with gladness and joy. It ends with hope and peace. Jesus is making all things new. And that is a hope for God's children that can carry us through any crisis that this is not lost, that all is not lost. Jesus is at work and, and there is a hope that was coming and is already here in him. It could carry God's children through any crisis, but it's also an invitation to those who do not yet know Christ as their Savior and King. There's an invitation here that Jesus wants to meet you wherever you are with the forgiveness of the cross and the peace of the resurrection if you will believe in him if you will follow mary's example and the disciples example even thomas's example and believe that jesus is the christ the son of god and that by by believing you may have life in his name jesus says to thomas in verse 29 have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. He's talking about us. He's talking about us. Will you hear that invitation this morning? Will you experience that blessing of knowing the forgiveness and new life that God offers through faith in Christ and find in him a hope that perhaps you didn't even know you were looking for. Hope of new life, forgiveness, peace with God, hope for a world made new when in that day we will finally feast in the very presence of God. My prayer for us this morning, may all of us, may today be a day when disappointment gives way to hope through Jesus Christ. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious Father, Lord, what can we say but thank you for your incredible love? Thank you, Lord, that we can be honest about our disappointments in this day, honest about um, the sadness of, of plans that didn't go the way we thought, we can be honest about the dislocation and frustration we're experiencing in this season, about the grief of lost loved ones or sick loved ones. We can be honest with you because you love us and because you have provided an answer to everything wrong with this world through the cross and you have provided hope and new life through your son's resurrection from the dead. Lord, would our hearts be gripped with hope today? Would our disappointment give way to hope and to, to the peace that we have in Christ as we trust him for strength for each day and as we look to the promise to come? 
where you will make good on all of your promises. Death will be no more. And we will feast with you in your presence and celebrate you, our victorious King. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.